some patches of cirrus up there at about 30,000 feet, adding some texture to this Thanksgiving sky here in Texas. We can see it on the visible imagery here, and that's that band moving across much of Oklahoma, all the way down to Dallas and around Corsicana. We can see that that's associated with this deep southwesterly flow starting to set up from the subtropics. The cirrus is a little bit more evident when we look at infrared imagery. And then when we go to water vapor imagery, we can see some of the vertical motion fields extending all the way from down here up through the cirrus regime. And then on the back side, it looks like there's a corresponding area of downward motion. The 500 millibar heights and vorticity definitely indicating that short wave at 12Z. And then if we advance that up to the current time, 18Z, that puts that short wave just about in the proper place. And that would indicate that the vertical motion field upward is ahead of it, and there should be a downward field just behind it. The axis does look to be a little bit spread out, so it's a little indeterminate up in the panhandles in New Mexico. But here, we certainly should find some downward motion. Elsewhere around the country, looks like a broad region of subsidence across the Midwest and Southeast U.S. In the Northwestern U.S., we have this cold signature that could mean very humid conditions, but it could also mean cold air. And in the Northeastern U.S., it definitely looks like we have a humid pattern. We've got warm air advection flowing in from the south. We've got convective elements. So this is going to be kind of a stormy condition, probably associated with this closed low around Syracuse, New York. And referring back to the 500 millibar heights and vorticity, this is where we saw the downward motion that's closely tied to that ridge right there. The convective activity in the northeast U.S. focusing on this area right here, and that's just ahead of this very potent cutoff low in New York. The upward motion being indicated here, well, that appears to be coincident with this ridge, which should give downward motion. So there's a possibility what we're seeing in the northwest U.S. could just be cold air. Well, we can take a look at a forecast QT, and I can see that already it's pretty cold in Idaho and Montana. And if we look at the sounding, that's a very cold sounding. This is zero. We start from 12 Fahrenheit near the surface, and it decreases down to minus 20 Celsius, minus 30, and minus 40. So this is a cold column. So that is not humidity. In a place like the Pacific off the Baja California coast, that same kind of blue color is not going to be associated with cold air. That's going to be tropical moisture. And referring back to the Washington, Idaho, Oregon area, these are some depressed thickness values down to 534, which is enough for snow. So that just confirms that that blue area on water vapor imagery is cold air. So where do we expect to find the fronts this afternoon? Let's bring this up to 18Z and look at the 500 millibar Hudson vorticity. A lot of these troughs are going to be representing cold air. So down in the lower levels, we can expect probably a cold air mass across Saskatchewan and northeastern Montana. Likewise, over southern California, southern Nevada, Utah, and likely another cold air mass over Pennsylvania and New York. The air masses could be larger in extent, but the cores should be close to where those troughs are and to a certain extent where the upper level vortex is. By finding the upper level jets and the troughs and ridges, we should be able to isolate where the surface systems are. One problem that we have is that the ridge across the Great Plains is heavily flattened. We should be able to pick out the Bear Clinic High somewhere in the Great Basin area. Also another Bear Clinic High likely 
in the Canadian high prairie, the bear clinic lows are a little bit more of a problem. One thing that we do is we look for the inflection points where the flow changes from cyclonic to anticyclonic. It's very indeterminate across the Great Plains, so generally I think maybe Bear Clinic Low somewhere in the Great Plains could be all the way back to Colorado and then surface front kind of like that. And also we would expect to find some sort of warm front supporting this ridge across the Midwest, so possibly warm front in there. Likewise up in Canada, inflection point, that's going to be roughly in this area here. Low pressure somewhere around James Bay. Maybe a cold front extending back. And then with this ridge out here, probably a warm front like that. And then same thing going on on the East Coast, kind of like that, and warm front like that. I don't expect that the surface systems are going to be located the way they're shown here because of the complexity of the split flow pattern and the indeterminate nature of some of these ridges. Got two troughs up north, maybe three, and that's going to complicate things also. However, picking out what we did, that's going to definitely help the surface analysis process. Well, one way we can get a jump on things is to look at the 700 millibar temperature we can see that there's certainly a very cold air mass across Saskatchewan and a lobe extending all the way down into Nevada. So when we were talking about that trough and that air mass over Montana and Saskatchewan, that likely links up with the stuff in Utah and Southern California. And the fronts, those are going to be found down to the south, at least on the 700 millibar chart. Looks like they're running something like this, low pressure there over Kansas warm front like that and I don't know let's see I'm not sure if that goes up north or not because I can also make a case for maybe something out in this area too I don't know I think maybe it could be this that we need to focus on anyway south of Tucson up towards Wichita Chicago and over to Washington DC down at 850 millibars, about 5,000 feet, we're going to get closer to the approximation of where that front is. Now, it is very important not to get hung up on this strong contrast. This particular color scheme really hammers in the difference between greens and blues, but sometimes the boundaries can be well to the south. So the best thing to do is start in the warm areas and work your way north. For example, I do see a boundary right there. I don't know, maybe that warm front kind of like that. And this carries somewhat like that. You can see that cold air push across western Kansas down towards Amarillo. And then the other boundary, I think that's all the way down here, connecting back up into the Albuquerque area. So this is getting close to where we're going to find the fronts at the surface. Looks like some warm downslope conditions there in Texas, and some of that extending all the way to Georgia. And there's what I have for the surface chart for this afternoon. Yeah, there's that high pressure we talked about. That's back in that area just ahead of that upper ridge. So certainly pressures are on the rise in the Great Plains or in the Great Basin. And that's driving all this cold air in through Tonopah, Vegas, St. George, all the way down towards Blythe, where they have a north wind. The frontal location a little bit indeterminate there in the Four Corners area, very, very difficult to find, but it does pick up around Amarillo out towards Oklahoma. You do see a lot of low clouds in the Midwest, and this was an area we identified as having strong subsidence. There it is, that large subsidence area centered on Tennessee, extending up towards Indiana. But you bring up the visible imagery, very extensive low cloud field. And we can tell that's a low cloud field because the infrared imagery just shows a dull gray color. Typically when we see 
this combination of patterns that indicates that there's very dry air just above the low levels and very moist air trapped in the low levels. Maybe an old frontal inversion might be involved. So we'll take a look out there, do a forecast sounding for southern Indiana. And there it is. You can see the very dry conditions, 700 millibars upwards, so 10,000 feet upwards. And in the low levels, a lot of trapped moisture in the lowest one kilometer. And up to the north, another Alberta clipper coming in from Saskatchewan. That corresponds to that little axis of cold air we saw. And then just a quick peek up in Canada shows things are very unsettled. Very cold conditions up there, but we don't really have much of a high pressure area on the move. Just maybe one little high around Cambridge Bay. And that's about it. So we're just bringing in this flow from the Pacific, maybe some strong overrunning, helping to produce snows in British Columbia. Okay, for our dynamics lesson, we're going to talk about the cold core barotropic low. And what I've got here is an idealized example. You can see the 508 50 millibar charts on the left. So this is going to be upper air. This is going to be lower levels here. And then here we have a cross section where you have the ground here and increasing height. We can see that this kind of low becomes stronger with height. Starts out as a weak low near the surface and becomes a strong low in the upper levels. And you can see that on the 850 millibar chart and the 500, it is a low pressure area with cold air in the center. And it intensifies with height. And likewise, we will find the lowest thickness in the center of this low. A couple characteristics of the barotropic low. It is vertical. It exhibits very little tilt. The surface portion is typically poorly defined. You may not even see much of a surface reflection at all. You can see that the slope of the pressure surfaces steepens with height, and this is what increases the pressure gradient force at these higher levels. That high slope there gives you a strong pressure gradient, and the wind field responds by strengthening quite a bit. Now we might find the cold core low either equatorward or poleward of the polar front jet. Here's an example of one that's equatorward. In other words, it's on the warm side of the jet. This is a cutoff low. There's the center of the circulation at 300 millibars, go down to 850, and it's pretty much in the same spot there. Again, these are known specifically as cutoff lows. They form when cold air is transported to low latitudes by a deep trough that kind of shears off. And the jet becomes more zonal and reorients up towards the north. Common locations for the cutoff low is the desert southwest, but they can occur just about anywhere, and a common time for them is in spring, but as we're seeing now, we tend to find a lot of them in the winter time also. Cold core barotropic lows in the area north of the jet are known as decaying waves. We can also refer to them as occlusions. Those types of lows are the last stage in the development of a frontal wave. It's basically the final stage. An example is right here on Elamir Island, northwest of Greenland. We go down to 850, and we find that low in the very same area. Common locations, the Aleutians, the far northern North Pacific, Iceland, Greenland, Labrador Sea, Baffin Island and Hudson Bay. But sometimes we can see those lows all the way down into the northern U.S. When they're down there, the media often refers to them as a polar vortex. But occlusions and decaying waves, those are actually normal features during the last part of the life cycle of a frontal system. So you should not be too surprised to find them in places like 
the US. Anyway, here's the thickness chart. You can see that the thickness lines form kind of a bullseye across Ilamir Island, very typical for occlusions. And down to the south, one little thickness contour, not quite lined up with the pressure lines, but this is certainly a cold core low. Okay, that's all for today. Hope you have a good Thanksgiving. And I'll leave you with this aerial footage of what Thanksgiving looks like in our part of Texas. Take care. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.